After her parents were devoured in a coastal raid by Sahuagin and their pet sharks, Charlia Wheat Reaper was raised from girlhood as an acolyte at the Matchlock Monastery, where the alchemists and monks protect the secret of making poisons, medicines, and most notoriously of all, black powder. For most of her life, she's walked the walls of the mountain temple, making sport of picking off all comers who try to climb their way up for an uninvited look at the temple's secret chemistries and sacred techniques. And when she wasn't doing that, she'd be busying herself repairing the temple's crumbling masonry, chiseling little doomed sculptures out of ice, or thrashing her masters on the way to being recognized as the foremost warrior of the temple. One day, a dogged band of travelers flying the banner of the regional monarchy made their way up the mountain pass as a dozen master gunners watched them for any sign of a false move. The representatives begged the aid of the masters of the temple, saying that all the king's best heroes had failed to deal with, the dwellers of the deep who now threaten the land. The masters of the temple agreed to send their finest warrior to test the metal of the Mind Flayer. So will Charlia live up to her name? And if so, which one? Shark Meat or the Reaper? What's up, folks? Mike for CMCC Builds here after surviving the California Hurricane with another build video as we wrap up the first season of The Gauntlet. This will be the final run for level 14, but the series will return at a new level with some big names and familiar faces. We will likely focus on the level 10 Gauntlet for that series this fall. Before we jump into the build, I want to give a special shout out and thanks to Ludic Savant who helped write this script and created the build. For those that don't know him, Ludic occasionally posts practical optimization advice grounded in experience and statistics. He's been involved in game design, competitive esports, speedrunning, where he broke a world record. His TTRPG experience spans the better part of three decades, so when chatter started to build up in the comments of my channel and in the Gauntlet Discord, which you should check out if you haven't already, Ludic took that as an interesting challenge. Can a marshal beat the Gauntlet? What about a marshal that's often cited as the weakest in the game? It's impossible, right? But let's see just how far it can get, and no cheating. Let's set some guidelines. One, the build must be single class. No taking three levels of monk and 11 levels of cleric or something like that. One through 14, all monk. Two, don't build to the test. If you recall Triant Monk's build, one of the areas he wanted to test out was his ability to do just that. Unfortunately, the test changed from his understanding, which was its own thing, but here, none of that. No swimming races or taking shape the flowing river or otherwise preparing for any specific challenge the gauntlet offers. Ludic will only take features he would take even if he had no idea what kind of challenge lies ahead. Three, he will attempt to keep all the sidekicks alive. Winning is not enough. The sidekicks must walk out of that temple alive for this to be considered a success. Ha, yeah, right. Basically what we're dealing with is an exercise in tactical gameplay rather than build optimization. And when you see this build, that will become readily apparent. Before we jump into that, I want to thank today's sponsor once again, Describe. Every time I go to the Describe website to look for content, I'm blown away by the music, the maps, and of course the beautiful descriptions of nearly anything that comes to mind. I like Describe so much, I went to them to discuss a partnership. They didn't approach me. I only want advertisers and partnerships on this channel that I believe in. When I invite people to play the gauntlet, it's because I think they're great people who are great at what they do. The same goes for sponsors, quality companies only, and Describe is certainly just that. They also have high quality interactive maps that include area descriptions and the sonic library with over 1900 RPG sound effects, ambiances, and pieces of music that can be played at the table or streamed to your virtual player. If you're on the fence about whether or not to sign up, just go for it. You'll love it and it does wonders to help out the channel. Check out the link below, describe.com slash cmcc. If you use that link, you get 10% off your first payment. All right, let's jump into it. Let's do it. It's go time. For the race, we'll stick to the basics, custom lineage, medium size, and dark vision. For the feet, however, we're going to take a unique one, something I haven't taken on this channel before, Aberrant Dragon Mark. This gives a plus one to constitution, a sorcerer cantrip, a first level sorcerer spell to be used once per long rest. I'm personally a fan of all the elemental cantrips like Shape Water, Control Flames, and Mold Earth. These provide a lot of versatility for a creative player but also have no verbal component, which means you can apply that creativity while stealth. Of those three, Shape Water best fits Charlia's background on a snowy mountain monastery, and she uses it to whittle little ice sculptures as a meditative exercise, so we'll take that one. If you're thinking to yourself right now, well, map one of the gauntlet is a water map, and he's taking Shape Water, that's building to the test. I wouldn't blame you, but I'd also suggest you check out many of Ludic's other builds that take the same cantrip. Some even include lengthy explanations of why and how the cantrip is extremely versatile and potentially powerful. 
For the first level spell, shield is a great grab, just in case we screw up and find ourselves in the way of too many attacks for comfort. For the stats, we're going 8 strength, 15 dex, 15 con, 8 intelligence, 14 wisdom, and 10 charisma. We use the racial ASI to bump dex to 17, and the dragon mark feet bumps constitution to 16. A good alternative would be to start with 15 wisdom and take a wisdom boosting half feet, or just awaiting a future ASI at level 16. This would give you a little less burst durability, but more sustained durability from passive AC and more healing, and a higher stunning strike DC, in addition to the benefits of the half feet itself, which would probably be something like Fey Touched. For the background, we'll use a custom background to get two skills and tools. Perception and Sleight of Hand will complement the monk proficiency as well. Thieves Tools and Poisoner's Kit to complement Shirley's backstory. For the starting equipment, she'll use a plus one musket, this is a gunk after all, along with standard adventuring gear including an adamantian spear, darts, sack of traps with hunting traps, and ball bearings, cow traps, all that stuff, basic PHP poison, water skins, sawdust, healing kit, lights and stuff to light them, a bunch of little artsy trinkets chiseled out of ice in her spare time, all of that. For the class, we of course are taking Monk, and with that, the Stealth, Acrobatics, and Mason's Tools proficiencies. At level 3, Ludic chooses a Mercy Monk here. Shadow Monk is another strong option for any Monk build, and the one my version of the gun takes. Shadow can really help transform your teammates into an Alpha Strike party, but that works better when your party consists of real PCs instead of sidekicks. Sidekicks greatly reduce your ability to force multiply. On top of that, there's no healer sidekick, and it can be very easy for the party members to get nickel and dime down. Mercy, on the other hand, offers a significant reserve of healing resources. For just one key, they heal about as much as a Celestial Warlock's healing light on full blast, plus cure status conditions to boot. Ludic's plan is to use this to keep hit points topped off after every encounter. People often say that monks are squishy, but this isn't particularly true for Tier 3 Mercy monks. In addition to their heal and ability to inflict disadvantage with no save via the Physician's Touch using Hand of Harm to inflict the Poison Condition, Tier 3 Monks acquire so many situational defenses that they kind of stop being situational. Their mobility protects them from melee attacks, Deflect Missiles protects them from ranged attacks, Diamond Mine makes all their saves solid, Evasion makes you virtually immune to deck saves, Purity of Body literally does make you immune to one of the most common damage types and conditions in the game, Poison, and a 17 AC might be meh, but it's about the same as what a fighter archer would have, and said fighter won't have our saves, deflect missiles, healing, mobility, or key defenses. So while we can use our mobility to kite a lot of stuff, we can also afford to take some hits for our allies. Right away at level 3, Mercy Monk gets proficiency in the insight and medicine skills, along with the herbalism kit. Hands of healing allow for a martial arts die plus wisdom mod of healing for a key point, or by replacing one strike from flurry of blows. Hands of harm does the opposite by inflicting necrotic damage for a key point. This scales with Physician's Touch at 6, which ends the Blinded, Deafened, Paralyzed, Poison, or Stun conditions, while Hand of Harm inflicts the Poison condition until the end of your next turn without a saving throw. It scales again at 11th level, allowing for two uses of Hand of Healing to replace each Flurry of Blows attack, and finally the Hand of Harm can replace a Flurry of Blows attack without any additional key points usage. At level 4, we take the gunner feat to bring dex to 18, get proficiency with firearms, which we need for our musket, and the ability to use ranged attacks in melee without disadvantage. The rest is just making sure that we're not merely surviving, but actually contributing value to the party with our presence on the battlefield. Remember, skirmishing is not a role. It helps your personal durability, something all characters need, and helps you get into position to do whatever your role is, but mobility itself isn't a role. It's a facilitator for your role. For that, we take Sharpshooter along with Gunner, so that we're dishing out 2-3 to three decent ranged hits every round. Focused Aim can be used to make these attacks accurate, as well as to trigger the bonus action shot from KFA, Key Fuel Attack. By 12, decks will be maxed out, again improving our accuracy. We also can close the melee in a pinch to dump stunning strikes at a particularly dangerous foe, or just to get Martial Arts or Flurry of Healing and Harm. If you're progressing from level 1, you probably want to start with Gunner for 18 decks unless you expect it to be a long time before you can actually afford a gun. Take Sharpshooter at 4, then Dex and Aberrant Dragon Mark at 8 and 12. There's nothing particularly sexy about this build, but that's exactly the point. How far can a strong player go primarily based on solid tactics, rather than crushing it with the raw build strength one can bring from, say, an optimized caster? So what do you think? Will Charlia be shark meat or a Reaper? Is it being overly ambitious to try to protect and carry the sidekicks instead of just focusing on kiting? Find out in the next Gauntlet video. See you there next time.